Okay. Should we? Any questions before we start? All right. <clears throat> So first off, I put assignment three online. Um, so you should have access to it. You should have access to it. So what it's asking you to do is basically just to go on the Covered California site and then you know put in if you if you follow follow through the steps here, you should be able to go through and pretty easily do it in terms of go, you know, in terms of the information, because this is all the information it's gonna look ask for, age. Um, it's going to ask for income, zip code, and then it's going to ask for the uh, um, for things like high users of different type of, of services. So if you just follow along with this, you should be able to get to that, you know, get to the premiums. And then what I've asked you to do is basically based upon those premiums, I mean, excuse me, based upon the options that you see, just answer a number of questions about it. Like, you know, what's the premium for this? What's the premium for that? That kind of thing. So it shouldn't be too... Too complicated to do. Any questions about assignment three? Okay. Um, it's due next week, um, but again, you know, you don't have to write very much. Um, so, you know, especially since we don't have a TA, I won't be giving you extensive comments. Um, so, really, all you have to do is just fill in that. You know, just answer the the questions. It's pretty simple. All right, the midterm is on the 19th. Um, it's gonna be in class, so no online option. Uh, if you need more time before the midterm, I mean, excuse me, if you need more time during the test, is that go talk to student services because I'll have to in here, you know, take the tests away at, at 4.15. Um, but if you need more time than that, then go talk to student services, but arrange it beforehand. So you can't contact me the day of and say, oh, I need more time. Um, so you have to do it before. Uh, there'll be 30 multiple choice questions. Um, it will cover the, you know, what we're doing in class uh, and also the lectures that I had you look at last time on the, for the history as well. Um, during the test, you can bring a, a sheet of paper and you can write whatever you want on the front and back of it. You can write as small as you want or as big as you want. Um, essentially what it does is it kind of saves you from having to memorize a bunch of stuff. So, you know, you can go through and write whatever you want. Um, you don't need a Scantron and you don't need a, a, um, a calculator. So there'll be no kind of figuring out complicated math problems on there or, or premiums. All you need is just to come to class and I'll give you the test and you'll answer the, the questions on the test and then give me back the test at the end of it. Um, to study and I'll... You know, I'll talk more about this as we go through, but essentially I'll give you a study, a study guide next week um, with some terms that kind of to go through. Um, I'll also give you a review session. I'm gonna get, I'll give you a sample test. And I'll also, I'll put something online just sort of how to study for, for this type of exam. Um, the, the uh, give you a review session on the 17th. So that's a Tuesday before. So we'll do an in-class review session on that day. And then the test is on the 19th. Any questions about the midterm? Now, if for some reason, you know, you think, oh, I can't take the midterm on the 19th, is that you have to have a really good reason um, because, you know, it's not very fair to give people tests on different days unless there's a really good reason to do it. And if you, for some reason, you know you can't make it on the 19th, then uh, then go ahead and, and, um, uh, and let me know before and let's arrange it before. Um, if you get sick that day, so if you wake up and you have COVID, then you can stay home and we'll deal with it at that point. Um, but, you know, because I don't want you to come in if you're sick, but at the same time, you know, it, it is expected that will be an in-class in test. Questions about the mid the midterm? Um, the way I would, you know, in terms of how to study for it, but I just, you know, we don't have a book for the class. Um, so the lecture, but the lecture notes are really long. So I put a lot of information in the lecture notes. And so I, I think the way to, to think about the lecture notes is that that is kind of the book. So oftentimes you'll notice that when I lecture, I don't go through line by line what the lecture notes say. 
um, especially when we were talking about some of the things like the Affordable Care Act and some of the details like that. But what I kind of expect is that you'll go through the lecture notes and you'll read them more carefully. So what I would do is I would go through the lecture notes and then just start keeping notes from the lecture notes about you know what it is that um, you know, the, the important things that were that were being highlighted in there. Um, and I and when I give you the terms next week, then take the terms and just to go through and just look for those terms as you go through. Because figure those things are going to be the important concepts that I want you to know. All right, questions about that? Yeah. Now you're late. You're late. We just answered that. Mm -hmm. The answer is that it's you can bring a one page sheet. From the back. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay. All right. So the history lectures. Now, this is honesty time. You have to show me by your thumbs how much you watch the history lectures on, on YouTube. Say, yes, I watched them all, to, oh, I watched some of them, to history lectures. What history lectures on YouTube? So show me by your thumbs. OK, well, enough that, that we can probably go through and talk about it. Um, so these are the terms that I kind of gave you. Any of those terms that you want to ask about? Anything in there that sort of strikes out, you know, that, that stands out that says. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not enough to print out and get your file whatever you want. It has to be a regular size piece of paper, but not a not a personal size. But other than that, yeah, write whatever you want. Okay. So I ask you these terms, you know. Let's see. How about if I pick one? How about um, um socialized medicine? What's that from? Uh, what is what what was it a good term or not good? Term? So they're kind of like related to like journey, like that is like what we call it. Oh, we'll get to figure that. Right. Or 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 communes. Yeah. No, communes. Yeah. So it was meant to be a bad term. And what was kind of considered socialized medicine? What did they? Well, who? Well, first off, who coined the term? Was it coined by Republicans and Congress? Democrats and Congress? Doctors? Or I'm sure it's not. How many say Republicans and Congress? Democrats? Doctors? And sure it's not. Yeah, no, it's So, the answer is doctors. The American Medical Association basically coined the term socialized medicine because they didn't want to have, they didn't want to have universal health care. Why didn't they want to have universal? Why didn't they want to have the government involved in health care? Yeah, we were specifically about that. <laughs> okay. What was it? What what was the doctor's afraid? If the got not all of them in public, what would they have been? They were afraid that the government was not really control how much they get paid. That they wanted to be able to keep. And also, so this is where the state thing comes in. The same thing is that they want to respect the patient doctor relationship and how to be their doctors and patients would have that special bond and the government would 
be involved in that. But for banks, they didn't want government to come through and just sort of say, you know, oh, you've got to go through and you know, I mean, this is what we're going to charge you. Know what we're going to do. Does the government tell? Does the government right now tell, you know, private uh, providers, doctors, or hospitals, or from Medicaid? Does the government just tell us what, what they're going to pay these um, doctors for Medicaid care? Or does, or can doctors try to measure the agents that they want? I'm going to give you, I'm going to go through these slides. We're going to rip through these slides. So I'm going to give you the quick, the quick review then Oops. of these things. Okay, ready? Speed, speed lecture. So we talked about this, about what healthcare was like before, before, um, before Columbus arrived. And estimates are about 50 to 100 million people. What percentage of people kind of died off after Columbus, uh, of Native Americans died off from disease after Columbus arrived? Well, I think about 80 to 90%. So even before, you know, before kind of the Spanish came came into the Southwest and everything else, they think about eighty to ninety percent of Native Americans died, and what did they die of? Smallpox, you know, all these different types of diseases that were rampant in Europe, that um, that killed off tons of people that then that weren't un, you know unknown here, and so they people didn't have immunities for them, and so when they came through, they killed off bunches of people. So lots of different types of mostly infectious diseases at that point. So that's all about the infectious, the different types of diseases. This is life expectancy. So life expectancy was, you know, poor in general, worse if you're a woman and worse if you're African American. So not surprisingly, throughout the 1800s. Then the next thing was about, well, first off, any questions about uh, what health was like, the, the state of health back in the 1800s? Essentially, it meant that if you think about the epidemiological transition by which countries go from most of the deaths being from infectious diseases to most of the deaths being from, um, from uh, uh, chronic diseases, back then, the US was in the infectious disease um, side of it. Now the U.S. is in the chronic disease side of it, and the change took place around early 1900s. Early 1900s, that's when more people started dying from chronic diseases than dying from infectious diseases. Theories of health. Okay, know these. You know, know these four things because those are the four things that kind of are the are the you know their theories about. Um, about um, kind of what causes health, but basically it, it comes down to it. Imbalances is that the theory of health was that you know you had these imbalances in your body, and so therefore if someone had a fever, they got red, and so therefore it must be because they had too much blood, and so the thing you would do is you know bleed people. So you know, have you heard of bleeding before? Show me that yes, you've heard of bleeding before, or no, you've never heard of bleeding. Yeah, so bleeding was. Was the common thing that they did because that was something that that um, that you know was supposed to relieve the the imbalance of too much blood. Um, the part about Washington, I think, it gave you a little article about Washington, about how George Washington died. Essentially, George Washington died because he got sick, and then they, you know, the doctors were very attentive to him and so bleeded him, and then he kept getting got sicker, and so they kept bleeding him, and so finally he died. So it's a case where actually, you know, that's a case where. The more healthcare you get, the worse off you are. Okay, so different humors in the body, et cetera. Go through all those. The thing to to to, re to remember about this, about sort of the way that you know, because if you ask yourself, well, okay, that this at this point, 
you know, I think that most people would say that's ridiculous that bleeding would be, you know, wouldn't, was some type of cure. So why is it that it lasted for so long? Why is it that, you know, this was, is what's unique about health in terms of other things. Like if you take farming, right? What happens if you're using a stupid farming practice and someone finds a better farming practice, a better way to grow, you know, corn? What happens? Well, some person grows a lot of corn. The other people who are not growing a lot of corn look over and they say, oh, wait, this, these people must be doing something right. So then they look at what they do and that then they copy it, right? So in health though, that, that didn't really happen. So why didn't it happen? I mean, because there wasn't very much that healthcare could do for you back in this period. That's the, that's the takeaway from this is that health couldn't really do very much for you. And so as a result, since, you know, since they don't really know, you know, since they can't really do much for you, is that it's not like that they can go through and that they can, you know, try different things and see if they work. So for example, bleeding, does bleeding make you better? No, but at the same time, if they did nothing, you might get better. And so therefore, if you, you know, bled someone and they got better, you might conclude, oh, look it, you know, it worked. At the same time, you know, um, that uh, if they don't do anything and the person dies and say, oh, look, at the person dies. So the point being is that health is really tough because it's really hard to sort of learn about, you know, to come up with what works and what doesn't work just by trial and error. Like it is for crops, you know, you can try different things and, and you can see your success because you see, you know, corn grow versus not grow. So you can see that there's a direct correlation that you can observe. But health is not that way. And especially because they didn't really have a scientific method, right? A way of going through and, and discovering knowledge. They didn't have like randomized control trials where you try this thing for this group and, and, and not for that group. And that really doesn't come in until, you know, well, the Renaissance hit and they start to look at more about, you know, how the body works. And then they start to, you know, the scientific method starts to come in like 1700s, 1800s. And so if you think about, the, the main way that we now have health knowledge, which is through randomized controlled trials, doesn't really arrive until really late. And even when it does arrive, they didn't really have very much to do. Like, you know, the famous um, story about how public health started is it starts from in England where they, you know, they're having a cholera outbreak and all these people are dying. And some, you know, someone, uh, I forget the guy's name. What's his name? Yeah. He goes through and he charts where, where all the deaths are and notices that they're around a, a certain um, uh, well. So he goes and he takes the handle and then death rates go down. So that's a randomized, you know, it's a trial, right? He, he did a, a, a little experiment to see if you take away access to this water, do death rates go down? And they did. So that's a case where he was trying, you know, doing the type of modern type of thing that we now think of in public health. But that didn't occur until what, the 1800s, 1700s? Whatever it was that he was doing, 1800s that he was doing this. So it's relatively late. So it meant that when we're talking about health, the type of health care that you get throughout the 1800s, it's not like they do a lot for you. And in some cases, they make you worse off. And in some cases, the treatments that they're giving are, you know, are making you much worse off. M most of the, um, the treatments that they give back then, you know, when would they start talking about patent medicines arising? What's a patent medicine? What do I mean by that? Yeah, I mean, like things like they, they advertise that, you know, they, they have this elixir um, that you can buy that will serve all these. In fact, my, um, my grandmother, who was born in the 1800s, 1800s, I remember talking to her about this because she lived in rural Pennsylvania. And rural Pennsylvania, they had a doctor, but the doctor didn't do very much. And so they used to have the medicine people come by and sell medicines, you know? And so they, she had a special medicine that for them, for babies, for teething, special medicine that she gave my mom and gave, you know, my aunt and people like that. And so, you know, I asked what was in the medicine because my, my grandmother was a nurse. I said, what was in the medicine? She goes, oh, alcohol. <laughs> it was basically whiskey. It was whiskey with a couple of things, but kept the babies quiet kept them from uh, their gums from hurting when they were teething. 
Um, so, you know, it was medicine because there was something else in there. It wasn't just pure alcohol, but alcohol was the main ingredient that they used. So, you know, those are the type of things that are being sold. And that's what people would use because there wasn't a lot of other treatments for, the, for things at that point. And so the point of this whole thing is just basically that these type of, of treatments that we now look upon as, you know, strange and barbaric and everything else, they arise because that they, they didn't have a way of, of testing out things. There wasn't much they did they could do. They didn't really understand how disease works, right? They don't really understand how the how the body works. And so, you know, they're kind of just in the dark trying different things along the way. Surgery, great example. You know, surgery, um, why is it that barber poles look like that? Because most of the surgeons were barbers. And so, and, you know, they're showing basically is that they, the red was for blood, but, you know, going into surgery was not something that you did, that you did um, by choice. It was like a last resort going in for surgery. All right. So then talk about the scientific approach, et cetera, kind of going through problems with medicine, knowledge in medicine, et cetera. So that's the whole point of that. Okay. Next part was basically about what healthcare was like. So, you know, this is the, what the, you know, what it was like, that, that's what the, you know, what they, the, what clinical medicine was like. Now we're gonna talk about like, well, so how did our healthcare system arise? Um, and again, health at this point, very primitive because there's not much you can do. You know, doctors through trial and error did learn some things, right? So doctors, I think were, they were still valued because they had seen a number of things. They could stop bleedings. They could, you know, but it wasn't like they had a whole a lot of things in their arsenal that they could do. Um, the two schools of medicine, of, of training back then, the uh, Orthodox and the Holistic. So the Orthodox, um, they were all into, into the intake and out, out go. So basically they look at what you eat. They're really into looking at, 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 at poop, at feces to sort of see what was in feces and what was in urine because they were, you know, they thought that's the way you could sort of tell what people's health was. Um, the, uh, uh, I think it's grain of grain cracker fame. Um, the reason that grain crackers were invented because he was really into this. And so he started this whole movement of, of looking at, you know, of these health things where they were doing all these bizarre practices. But they're all based upon this idea that, you know, this inflow and out, outgo from your body um, but the holistic thing, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was all based upon that, um, that you want to restore balance. Whereas the orthodox, excuse me, the holistic was all about ba balance. The um, orthodox was all about the inflow and out outflow. So physician's job at this point, you know, not do very much. Here's what the, uh, what type of things they had that they treated people with, but they also use mercury arsenic, um, strychnine, things that could kill you. So this is where patent medicines arise. You know, fun fact that, that the reason we had newspapers um, was because during the uh, Revolutionary War or sh shortly after the Revolutionary War is that, you know, there are all these, you know, people were printing these little one sheet things and trying to sell them. But it was because patent medicine needed a place to advertise that they started to pay basically these news, what you know, we now know as newspapers, to basically put their advertisements on it. So that's how newspapers became kind of, you know, the thing that were cheap and you had lots and lots of different newspapers because they were the main source of advertising. The newspapers died for the most part when um, and the paper newspapers died when the internet came along because suddenly, uh, you know, advertisers don't need newspapers anymore to advertise. Um, but that's how, why we had newspapers was because of they wanted initially as a places to, to, to advertise for these patent medicines. Okay, so we talked about that going through um, medical education, got your two schools, but the basic type of training is the same in each one, which is that's kind of an apprenticeship whereby you would go and that, you know, you'd pay some money and then you could sort of follow a doctor around for a while. That was the early type. Um, so poor education um, in Europe, 
medical education was you know was growing because in Europe it, was, it became much more science based from the from the early point it became more science based and so the idea of of um of you know doctors as scientists starts to infiltrate through the 1800s into the U.S. medical education but for the most part through the 1800s it's still pretty much you know especially the middle part of the 1800s it's an apprenticeship type thing where you know some some group of doctors would say okay we're going to take you know, we're going to take that, um, you know, you pay us some money and that we'll let you follow us around and that, and that they'll set these dispensaries. And so dispensaries were places where, where, where the poor could get treated and they would let these junior doctors go out there and treat people in these dispensaries. But it wasn't the type of what we think about as medical training now. Okay. John Hopkins is the first kind of medical, the real medical school in the US. So, and it gets set up because it's sort of following this um, European type model of trying to be more science-based. Um, and then, you know, gradually what's gonna happen is that you're gonna have this, you know, this kind of uh, um, conflict between the holistic type of, of, med of medical education and then the more science-based medical education, the orthodox. So the orthodox, becomes, you know, it becomes the kind of the European model and the holistic remains as kind of the, the more, you know, um, uh, you know, everyone can be their own doctors or at least, you know, they can know a lot about medicine, they can treat themselves, et cetera. And, you know, there's not that much difference between the camps in terms of what they can actually do because even though the science-based ones are what we think of as, doc as medical education and doctors now, at that point, they knew some things, but not a lot of things. So it's still, by the end of the 1800s, you're not in the situation whereby one, one branch of medicine is much more um, effective than the other branch of medicine. They're about the same. All right. Um, so just to, you know, so where, where we sit at the end of the 1800s, um, medical practice is, you know, kind of uh, in disarray. Um, because you don't really have, like, there's no consistency in how people get trained. Um, there's no kind of way of going through and, and certifying who's a doctor, and who's not a doctor. Um, and also, it's, it, it can be really hard to make a living as a doctor, especially if you're in a rural area. So, I mean, if you think about back then, if you're a rural doctor, you know, if you're in, I don't know, Planada, um, and you're trying to be a doctor in Planada, how many patients are you going to see a day? Well, not a lot because our, you know, it's not a very good population center. And if you have to go out to where people are, is that then you're going to be going, you know, traveling five or six miles to see each individual. So the number of people you could see in a, in a day is very, very small. So it means that it's hard for doctors to make a living back then because just it was, took too much time to go see everyone. Doctors in cities had it better because they, you know, they could see more people and so that the type of practice that we now think of it as a as you know, as the standard type of way where there's a waiting room and people come and sit down and wait in the waiting room and doctors see everyone that's sort of arises this part in cities but in rural areas it wasn't that way so rural areas then and now still you know suffer from the um, from the the fact that there's such great distance and such small population bases is that they just can't have the same type of of you know concentration of, of, uh, of services as they do in urban areas. Okay. Um, so they had, key thing to, to get from this is that you've got, you know, doctors, independent practices, you know, independent people. You've got um, dispensaries. That's the ones that are being run by, by, uh, um, by students. Um, you then have mental asylums. And like a lot of states and counties sort of ran their own mental asylums. And as you can imagine back then, not nice places, right? Not places where you wanted to end up. They were essentially is that if somebody was, you know, deemed crazy and crazy could just mean, you know, a lot of women were deemed, deemed crazy is that then they would just send you to these asylums and, and that would, you know, that's where you were. So California's, you know, with, California had a, has an ignoble history of mental institutions. Um, I think that you know, Cabrillo was the last one to close down and it was probably in the 1970s to close down. Um, and that it was known as a horrible place, absolutely horrible place. So mental institutions 
have traditionally not been, you know, like great places to get care. They're basically just places to put people. Hospitals then arise not as places to similarly, hospitals did not arise as places where people went to get better. Hospitals arose as places where you put the poor who were sick. So, you know, if you think about during the 1800s, especially in big cities, you've got all these people who are dying from infectious diseases. You know, so you have poor people who are dying and then just dying in the streets. Rich people tend to not like that when they see, you know, poor people dying in the streets from infectious diseases because they don't want to get die of infectious disease. And so they start, these cities start to fund hospitals, but the hospitals then aren't, you know, they're not um, places that we think of now as hospitals. They're basically just places where people go who are sick to get them off the street and mostly poor people. Rich people or, you know, people with, with incomes, they got treatment at home. So they would just stay at home, which is you know, back then was much better chance of survival if you stayed home than if you went to a hospital. So I think the estimates were like, what, 75%? of people who entered the hospital died. So it was not someplace that, there was not treatments going on there in the same way that we think about it now. It was basically just a way to get people off the streets. All right, it's hard to keep, make living as a doctor, talked about that. Medical education, yeah, talked about that. So government in this stage, what's their involvement in healthcare? Not very much. Um, government started to threaten to get involved for patent medicines, because a lot of the patent medicines, um, you know, that were being sold, were you know killing people. They you know had mercury and arsenic and things like that. So government sort of threatened to be involved. But what you see within healthcare, over and over again, is that the government will threaten to get involved in things, and then the industry says, "Oh no no no, don't get involved. We'll monitor it ourselves." So this occurs with um, you know, like the American Medical Association. It arises because. People are, are afraid that they're going to go through and uh, I mean that, that doctors are afraid the government's going to come and start regulating them. And so they say, oh no, don't do that. We'll regulate ourselves. So even now, you know, if you look at within a county, who is it that's that certifies doctors? Well, there's a panel, there's a group that certifies doctors when you come into a county, and that group are doctors, right? So doctors certify each other. Even though it's the county's responsibility to kind of make sure that you know, that I can't just go and start practicing as a doctor. What the county does is that they have, you know, people from, from doctors who go through and, and, uh, and do that. So is that good that all these institutions like pharmacies, you know, um, doctors, hospitals, everything, all regulate themselves? I mean, what's the good side of that? What's the good side? Yeah. Well, that's the, I mean, from their standpoint, I mean, from a public standpoint, what's the good, what's the rationale for why it is that you might want to have doctors regulate themselves rather than having county officials regulate them? Because county officials may not know anything about medicine, right? And so therefore, it's this question about like, if, you know, how can you tell if a doctor has been negligent or not? And the argument is that, well, you know, someone like you and I, we can't tell because we don't know what it's like to be a doctor. But other doctors will know. And so therefore, that's why they want to you know, regulate themselves because then they know what it's like. And, and the argument is that they care about their reputation so much is that they'll weed out all the bad doctors because they don't want to have these bad doctors you know, kind of in there. So that's true. Um, the downside of it is that they can weed out people who they don't like as well, who are not bad doctors. And so throughout the 1800s and 1900s, the type of doctors that they would weed out were doctors who were wanted to go towards universal health care. So what you also see is that this self-regulation of healthcare professionals throughout means that, like, you know, if a doctor comes in and says, I want to start a clinic, and I'm going to start a clinic whereby everyone just pays me a certain amount of money and I'll provide all the health care to them which is you know, basically what universal care is, right? That's what, how HMOs start. And you know, if the other doctors don't want that, then they can not certify the, the doctor, but not because the person's not a good doctor, but just because they don't want to have that type of healthcare competition kind of in the, in the county. So that starts to occur throughout the 18 and 1900s is this, this sense that as there's more and more push to get you know, universal healthcare, 
to get everyone to have access to healthcare. There's pushback from the medical establishment and the medical establishment, because they go through that they have, are regulating themselves is that they can actually kick out doctors from, from the region if they don't, you know, not for medical reasons, not because they're bad doctors, but just because that they don't like the type of, of healthcare system that they're bringing in. That's that one that threatens the, the structure that they have right then. Okay, so turn of the century, um, healthcare is at a crossroads, right? You've got these two schools, orthodox, and you've got the uh, um, the holistic. Um, you've got medical, you know, the, the, start, the, the, the orthodox ones, they're starting to become more science-based and that um, they're looking at Europe and how Europe has developed. So in the US, if you're an orthodox school and you want, you know, if you're an orthodox, if you want to do orthodox training and you need to find scientists, where do you find scientists? Back in the late 1800s, where do you find scientists? You're sitting in a place where you find scientists. Universities, right? Universities is where you find scientists. And so, you know, as more and more medicines for the orthodox medicine starts to become more science-based, they start to look around and say, well, you know, where are we going to find these chemists? And where are we going to find, you know, biomedical scientists and things like that? And the place you find is universities. And so that's the point where you suddenly start seeing universities become involved with medical training because they weren't before that, right? I mean, Hopkins set up a, a medical school, but it wasn't a university. It was just, you know, they happened to, to hire the same people as universities, but only because they had a ton of money. But for the most part, most medical schools start to become associated with universities because they need the sciences. It's like even now, most, most medical schools are closely associated with the biomedical faculty. That whatever medical school you look at is that you'll see a lot of, you know, that the, the biomedical faculty will be the ones who basically run the medical program. Why is that? Well, because if you, you know, like in a medical program, you need someone to teach anatomy, let's say. Right. And so how how much, you know, for, for medical students, how often, how much anatomy do you need? You don't need a full-time person who teaches anatomy to teach medical school. In fact, when I was a um when I first started in a in a teaching in a medical school, you know, as a health economist, my I was teaching in an MPH program that also but it was within a medical school. And so they came to me. And they said, when I first started, they said, well, you're going to teach the medical students and you're going to teach the second year medical students and you'll have um, three hours. And I thought, okay, three hours a week to teach second year medical students about health economics. I can do that. So I laid out this course about you know, how it could be. And I thought it was a, a brilliant course. Laid out this course for you know over like 15 weeks, how I was going to teach them about health economics and everything. So I bring the, the syllabus to my head of department and I say, okay, I've got this now, you know, and he looks at this and he says, oh no, no, it's not three hours a week. It's three hours for the year. And now it's down to two hours because we gave another hour to the, to an epidemiologist. So I went in there and I talked to them for two hours about health economics. What is it that you can teach second year medical students about health economics in, in two hours? Zero. They don't care about it. There's absolutely no relevance to what they're doing. So what did I do the other 90, you know, 98% of my time? Well, I taught, you know, I taught other things. And so that's the way medical schools work. You need people to come in and teach very specific things and very limited time. But then the question is, what do you do with them the other 90% of their time? So in a university, they go and they teach undergraduates and, and graduate students, and then they come over and teach their section of the medical program and then go back. But if you're trying to set up a medical school where you're just a medical school, then how do you get all these different people? You either have to have a lot of money to hire all these different people and have them sitting around, or you get grants. So a lot of medical programs then develop because they started you know, having all these people sitting around who didn't who were going to go teach just 10 hours a, a year to these, um, to these students. And what are they going to do the other 90% you know, of their time? And so they did the research. So as a result of, of this type of university kind of linking, it meant that universities had the people who could come in. But at the same time, it also meant that you had a whole bunch of people 
who had other time to do other things. And so that's where you get undergraduate programs arise, and that's where you get, et cetera. So universities really benefit from having this type of link, this type of medical education. But anyways, that's where they are. 1900s, you're at this crossroads. You still have this holistic and the science base. It's kind of going through. Um, so first thing that happened in there is that, you know, is that the debate ends. The debate ends uh, in um, because during the 1900s, the American Medical Association says, we're going we're gonna to do a report and we're, that's going to recommend what medical education should look like. And they got someone in who was basically in the Orthodox school and named Flexner. And Flexner comes out and says, and says, well, the only medical education that's worth anything is um is the uh, uh, is the Orthodox school, and so basically, um, the holistic school is gone. So at that point, then the holistic school just disappears from uh, from medical education, and everything from then on becomes just science based. Um. Yeah, so it comes, so that's how medical, that's how we get our current type of medical education is because the Flexner report comes along and wipes out the holistic way and just says, from now on, science is the only way to go. You know, it coincided with the rise of science as we think of it now. So, you know, it was probably the right call to make, um, but what it, you know, but it was also, uh, it was also self-serving because it meant that suddenly the only type of, of medical education that you're gonna have then is this sort of burgeoning science-based medical education as opposed to the more holistic type. Okay, this is also the point where suddenly health insurance arises. So one question you might ask is, well, why didn't we have health insurance before? Why, didn't, why was there no need for health insurance before the 1900s? That is that why didn't people in the, 19, in the 1800s have health insurance? And the answer is because they couldn't, health didn't, you know, healthcare didn't do much for you. And so, you know, you basically had a pay-as-you-go system where if you had money, you could afford a doctor. But if you didn't have money, then there's usually people in the family who knew how to treat you. And there was, you know, the holistic method was something for which many people could learn. And so it was, there was more just general type of health knowledge in the community. So it meant that, you know, that for the most part, they just weren't as dependent upon doctors and that especially there was no, you know, no high tech hospitals, nothing like that. It only becomes in the 1900s that suddenly healthcare becomes, they start to do more for you, that suddenly there's a need to, to kind of, you know, get more healthcare. And healthcare, you know, who needs healthcare? Well, old people need healthcare, but, you know, that doesn't rise for that. Who else needs healthcare during the early 1900s? People who get hurt a lot. Who gets hurt a lot? Workers in factories and lumberjacks and things like that. And that these people are all skilled workers. So, you know, the, when you have skilled workers, that means that suddenly employers really, really care about their workers getting hurt because if their workers, you know, before the 18th, before the 1900s, if a worker you know got hurt and he wasn't a skilled worker, you just bring someone else in and they do the job. But now suddenly, as as more and more people start to get jobs where they're skilled, you know, because they're doing more manufacturing jobs, more kind of things that require skills, is that um, is that now suddenly you know employers don't want to want these people to be injured, and they also if they do get injured, they want them to come back. So it's actually because of the kind of the the fact that we have this need for skilled workers that you suddenly see all these different people, um, you know, all these different kind of healthcare and insurance plans arising. And they mostly arise for, for, for employers who are trying to get their workers to get healthcare to come back to work as soon as possible. So that's where it kind of arises. Um, at the same time, this is where we start to see national calls for healthcare. So, um, you know, the first kind of, what we now think of as universal healthcare was in Germany, in Kaiser's Germany in 1883. And that, uh, you know, they, what, they, what they did in Germany back in 1883 is they basically said everyone has a right to healthcare. So they gave universal access, they said everyone can access healthcare. And so, you know, there starts to be calls for, um, for that here as well. Why? Well, because there were so many German immigrants into the US during that period. 
especially up in the um, like Wisconsin and Minnesota and North Dakota and all those upper areas up there, they had more German speakers than they had English speakers during this period. Um, and so they, you know, that they come with this idea that, well, yes, you know, we should have this type of socialized medicine, this national health insurance. And so there starts to be this push for it. And so this push kind of goes along where it's gaining more momentum. The American Medical Association at this point is not much against it because they, you know, um, so it's, there's not really much opposition and then it falls apart. Why? What kills it? What kills the movement in the, in the you know, 19 teens for universal health care? World War I, right? Suddenly universal health care that's started by the Germans, by you know, the Kaiser, is not something that the US wants to support. And so it gets canceled just primarily because it was associated with, with the Kaiser's Germany, World War I. And since the US was fighting in the was fighting the Germans in World War I, is that it dies. So that's the first, so this will be the first time, but not the last time, that universal health care kind of comes up almost gets to the finish line, and it, but doesn't. Um, Spanish flu hits in, uh, in 18, 19, 1918, 1919. Um, Spanish flu, more deadly than COVID or less deadly? I'm gonna say more deadly, I'm gonna say less deadly. Yeah, it's well, it's hard to say because um, it's more deadly for young people, right? It, it tend to kill, so the, the Spanish flu tended to, to differ from the COVID in that the Spanish flu killed like, you know, you, right? It killed young people who are healthy. And primarily is because, um, as I understand it, it was because what the Spanish flu did is it just caused this hyperimmune response. And so people would, you know, people who were young and healthy had a stronger immune response. So they would be more likely to die from it than someone who was old who had a weaker immune response. And Spanish flu also just, you know, in case you're ever interested, it kind of differed from COVID as well, and that the Spanish flu would come through and in six weeks it'd be gone. So you didn't really, you had some school closures, you had mass mandates and all the, the same type of things, and also resistant to mass mandates back then, resistant to school closures. So a lot of the same things that we saw in COVID were that happened back during the Spanish flu. But the difference was, was that Spanish flu tended to come and go. It came in waves, it came back a couple of times. Like, you know, there was a wave that kind of hit in the in early 1918, and then it kind of went away, and then it hit with a vengeance later on. Um, so it went in waves, but at the same time, it wasn't like COVID, where it's just pretty much here. And it kind of goes up and down a little bit, but it doesn't, it doesn't sort of go away like the Spanish flu does, at least it hasn't so far. So public health at this point, or you know, medicine kind of jumps into action to try and figure out what's going on with this. With this. And because you suddenly have all the science-based type of, of you know, looking at, at health, at medicine, um, it goes through in that, it kind of causes the, what we now think of as like the CDC as the primary, um, the premier, yeah, it used to be, the premier kind of infectious disease control um, center in the world sort of starts at this, at this period because, you know, they're trying to look at the Spanish flu and figure out what's going on. So the way that it, it went through and killed, and, excuse me, the way that it went through and, um, and, uh, and impacted healthcare then is that after the Spanish flu left is that public health in general, right? Public health as we know it now becomes much more science-based than it was before that. So before that, public health was, was really just focused on, on trying to um, you know, keep people who are infectious on boats to be quarantined. So it was doing sort of that type of thing. After the Spanish flu, or as, or as a result of the Spanish flu, public health becomes kind of synonymous with, with more um, with what the CDC kind of does now, right? Which is to, to try and, and look at infectious diseases, try to figure out how to you know, get vaccines for infectious diseases, all those things start to become core public health as a result of this. Um, just also, interestingly, after the uh, Spanish flu left, is that there was a decrease in, um, in trust in government. Because even though, you know, from, the, from at this stage, you look and you think, oh, well, the Spanish flu caused public health to become more science-based, which is good, right? At the time, 
the public saw public health is failing because it didn't stop this thing. And so therefore, you know, sort of trust in government kind of fell during the 1920s um, because of this. Okay, let's see. Depression hits in 1929. Um, depression lasts for, for, you know, really until World War II. So, you know, US goes into a depression in 1929, um, uh, and then it, you know, basically 25 to 45% unemployment. Um, and that, you know, people who were kind of, uh, did have jobs, they, you know, they um, um, oftentimes they still, you know, didn't have enough, enough to eat, didn't have enough income. You know, so all the different stories that come out about the Great Depression kind of occurred during this point when, when you know, the country goes into a, 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 the, a horrendous economic, um, economic fall. It's also the period where communism arises in this country. So communism, you know, sort of Russia becomes communist in after in World War One. Um, so you know that's where the the czar gets kicked out and killed during World War One, and, and communism sort of takes over. And so at the time, communism was seen as going to be the you know the way that workers regain power in uh, over the wealthy. And world the depression hits, and that's what you know essentially comes along is that all these people are looking to think. You know that the depression was caused by these wealthy bankers, which it kind of was, um, caused by these wealthy bankers, and that they're all still living fine, and and people are are suffering in the street. So communism starts to become come very very much um, uh, kind of a, a a popular kind of notion among people among workers. So you know this comes out later on because when they start doing all the all the, the looking into diff pe different people's communist past during the nineteen fifties. Is that they find a lot of people, you know, were calling themselves communists during the 1930s because things were so bad and, and people were looking for communism. So, from a healthcare standpoint, right, um, Roosevelt takes over in 32. Roosevelt comes through and you know says, "Got to do something." Sees that you know that the, that civil unrest is getting um, more of a problem that people might go, start going through in rioting, that the country might go over to communism. So Roosevelt tries a number of different things. And one thing he does is introduces social security. So social security then is, is therefore you know, aimed at the, these types of groups, right? Elderly, unemployed, et cetera. Not all un unemployed, but some unemployed um, to get, you know, to, to basically provide um, uh, benefits to them. So at the time, Roosevelt thinks also wanted to include healthcare in this as well. So you know, this is sort of the the second incarnation then of attempts to universal care is that um, Roosevelt wants to go through and include as part of Social Security that you get rights to healthcare benefits. And this time, it's it's um, opposed by the American Medical Association. So this starts the American Medical Association's basically, you know, what 50, 60, 70. 80 year um, campaign against having universal health care. And as I said, they didn't want to have universal health care because they didn't want the government to come through and control things. Um, this is where Blue Cross arises. So Blue Cross and Blue Shield arise there. So Blue Cross was about um, hospital care. And the idea being is that is that you know you would pay a certain amount into a uh, into a you know, fund, and that the net fund would then cover your health, your hospitalizations. Um, notice that it didn't include private physician payment. Why didn't it include private physician payments? Because, because the American Medical Association didn't want to, to limit, you know, what doctors could charge patients. So therefore, that was separate. Um, Blue Shield kind of arises then as a way of, of doing uh, of paying physicians, but at the same time, um, the American Medical Association kind of agrees with it, but only become physicians are on the board. So they sort of thought, okay, so insurance itself, you know, if you think about from a from a physician standpoint, is insurance a good thing? Well, yes, it's a good thing because you want to be paid for your services, and if someone gets sick and suddenly doesn't can't work, they can't pay for the insurance, you know, they can't pay for your services. So therefore, insurance allows that kind of to happen, right? Allows them to, to still get paid for treating people when they get sick and they can't work. 
So from a physician standpoint, you know, they would like the idea of insurance. What they don't like is they don't like the idea of having limited the payments. So how do you get an insurance system where you don't limit the payments? Well, you have your physicians control what the, you know, you, have, you can control what the payments are as a physician. So therefore, physicians went along with this because physicians were running it, were determining what the payments were going to be. So they never had to worry about the government coming in and trying to, to set what the payments are going to be. So it's this control of, of, you know, physicians wanting to keep control of their own payment system, which kind of keeps going through this, through history. And every time there's a, there's a call for universal health care, is that it gets opposed by physicians because universal health care means everyone gets health insurance, you know, from the government. And so the question is, how do physicians still keep the ability to charge what they want if the government is coming through and saying and deciding how much the people are going to get paid. So they keep on opposing it all the way through. All right, so let's see, go through that. So World War II hits, right? World War II hits and unemployment goes away. Um, larger companies like, you know, Kaiser Shipyards over in Richmond, um, they, you know, they expand greatly, right? Because they're now, you know, everything is now you know, uh, war effort. And so Kaiser expands greatly. And so they have over 100,000 um, employees. And so Kaiser now, you know, being from Germany originally, likes this idea of giving their the workers health insurance. And so Kaiser starts to offer health insurance to, you know, health care plans to the workers. So all 100,000 of these workers then have these health plans. Well, World War II ends, and Kaiser is left with, you know, they have 100,000 100, people they were employing. It's going to go down to 15,000 or 10,000 or whatever. And so they have this whole health infrastructure. So Kaiser's faced with this question about, well, what do they do? Do they basically just, you know, close down all the healthcare infrastructure or do they offer to the public? So Kaiser at this point says, well, let's just start offering to, this, to the public. But it was the same type of, you know, it's, it's, some, it's the basics of what Kaiser is today is was still then, which is that they're gonna, you know, doctors are on salary. So that's different than than most other places, doctors are on salary. And that um, you know, you pay a certain amount. There's all this emphasis on prevention, because that's just like there is now. Um, and that you have a doctor's group and you have the health insurance group, and that they're technically not the same, but they have a relationship where they only are going to work with each other. Okay, so understand the difference between Kaiser. So Kaiser is managed care, basically. It's the, it's the first sort of large, it's not the first managed care, not the first kind of HMO, but it's the first large one. Goes through there. Mm. So by the end of this then, the conclusion is that by the 1945, so the end of World War II, is that you suddenly have um, medical practice is much more organized. The medical training is much more organized than it was. So before it was just this, you know, two schools and people kind of um, being trained um, in uh, by you know, groups of physicians. By the end of the 1945, is that we have what we now look at as the modern type of medical training. The other thing that happens during this period is that um, you know doctors become as doctors can do more. They start and, and as as science starts to take over in medicine, it means that people like me and you can't really understand as much about what's going on. So you lose kind of the, the ability of these people at home to kind of treat people, right? To be holistic type of, of healers. Instead, you're relying upon this type of, you know, special trained, especially trained type of people who are going to deliver healthcare. So that means that you now have an agency relationship. So this idea of an agency relationship arises during this point, because as doctors get more powerful, more knowledge is that they start to, you know, becomes harder for us to understand whether what they're doing is a good job or not. That's the that's the principal agent problem right there. So the whole agency relationship in health doesn't really exist in 1900, but by 1945, it's definitely there. This is also when you know, doctors are all wearing white coats when they're uh, even in general practice, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to project to you is that they are the you know, the holders, the high priests who hold the knowledge and that you have to then trust them because of it. 
Um, also, by this point, hospitals have changed. So remember, hospitals, 1800s, just places where people went to die. By the end of the 1800s, um, hospitals are places where, uh, I mean, excuse me, by 1945, hospitals can do things. And so, you know, they start to become more, you know, more surgical centers, more kind of high-tech type of things start becoming hospitals. So hospitals become kind of the focus. And so now doctors who are, you know, out there working in the in the community, you know, down here in Yosemite Avenue, they have to rely upon the hospital because they can't afford to have their own surgical center and they can't afford to have all their other kind of high tech type things. The hospital can. So the hospital becomes now the hub and the doctors then, you know, are the ones who have to rely upon the hospital. But it also means that the hospital, because they can't, you know, have patients, they, they can't sign up patients as part of their, you know, of what they do, they have to rely upon doctors. So it means that hospitals now are in this weird position whereby doctors need them because they're gonna be the high tech centers, but at the same time, they have to attract doctors because doctors have the patients. So if you're a place with, you know, down in Fresno where you have St. Agnes and the community hospital and a couple of other ones now, it means that they're all kind of competing for doctors. They're trying to, to get these doctors to, to kind of come to them so that their doctors, you know, they're, they'll bring their patients with them. Um, doctors make a good living by this point. So doc, you know, as their prestige rises, salaries rise as well. So um, by the 1945s, doctors are now you know, up there in the, among the highest paid in the US. <clears throat> and medical education looks like it does now. Okay. Continuing with the fire hygiene approach to, to history. 1945 to 1970, um, three big things occur. One is the third failure to adopt universal health care. Uh, second one is the is what's referred to as the rise of medicine. So during the 1940-1970 period, it's sort of seen as the golden age of, age of medicine. And then the other thing that happens is that government gets into it. So, you know, up until 1945, I mean, yeah, the government provided GIs with healthcare, but the government really, you know, wasn't really providing healthcare to people. And once the World War II ended, then the government stopped providing healthcare to people. So at the end of World War II, now this debate starts about, you know, what, what should the U.S. do with healthcare? And because what was happening around the world at this point is that the uh, other countries were starting to adopt universal healthcare. So this is where the UK kind of comes through and adopts universal health care. This is where France does. You know, Germany already had it in the 1800s. Um, Canada adopts university, universal health care at this point. So all these different countries adopt universal health care at this point. And so the debate is raging within the US about whether or not to adopt universal health care. Truman, president at the time, um, wants universal health care. He's very supportive of it. Main opposition comes from American Medical Association doesn't want universal health care, doesn't want the government to come through and to set, you know, to provide health insurance. So American Medical Association, this is where they come up with their socialized medicine campaign. Because, you know, at this point also, the U.S. is starting to become rabid about anti-communism. Um, and so what the Medical Association does is that they link, you know, they sort of say, ah, oh, socialized, you know, if you if the government controls medicine, then you have socialized medicine. Then you're, you're just like in Russia, where the government's telling people what to do and losing all freedom and things like that. So this is where um, uh, you know the um, the battle is lost by Truman. So and when Eisenhower takes office, then the healthcare bill just dies. So that's our what, third third attempt now to get universal healthcare fails. During, the, during this period, even though lots, you know, most of the rest of the industrialized world at this point adopts it, the US doesn't do it. So I go through different type of reasons for why it, it didn't pass. Um, it's kind of complicated because ironically, you know, you'd think that labor unions, which were very strong during this period, would want universal health care. But no, they didn't want universal health care because what they wanted is that they wanted to basically negotiate healthcare for their workers. So it meant that labor unions, which you would think would be like all for universal healthcare, 
actually were, were not very enthusiastic for it because they wanted to, you know, price their, I mean, they wanted like American auto workers, you know, on strike right now, right? One of the things that they're arguing for is to return healthcare benefits like they used to be, because that was something that they could give their, you know, that the union could give. Uh, let's see, institutional reasons, yep, so you can understand that, ideological. Um, tax aversion, the US tends to dislike taxes more than other countries. Um, but the other thing then is just the rise of private insurance, because as the, you know, as the US, uh, what was I reading? I think I read that during the ninth, early 1950s, the US had 80% of the industrial output of the world came from the US, which is staggering when you think of it. Um, and so it meant that the US was basically, you know, going through this, this manufacturing boom. And so companies really needed workers. And so one way that companies could then go ahead and try to entice workers was through healthcare. So this is the point where companies start to offer health insurance to people as part of your employment. You know, if you think about it, why would companies be involved with offering healthcare to people and their families? I mean, that's not something that necessarily companies want to do. Is that, and the only reason they did is because they were, didn't want to raise pay and it was easier to go through and to, to you know, offer healthcare insurance, knowing is that, because healthcare insurance wasn't that expensive. Hospitalizations at this time wasn't really very expensive. So it wasn't a big cost. It was just sort of seen as something they could do to entice workers. And, and labor unions were going through and were, were negotiating it. But the result was that by the end of the 1950s is that you know, the majority of people who are working get health insurance through their employers. So in a way, you know, the Congress and the federal government could say, woohoo, we don't have to worry about, about, you know, about offering universal health care because the private sector has come through and done it. So private sector comes through, you know, for the most part, for lots of workers, they're offering health insurance. So if you ask, well, who's left out from this? Well, who's left out are elderly because they're not working anymore. And also, you know, people who are poor. So that's where the government comes in then, right? So the government comes in because it's going to offer, you know, Medicare and Medicaid at this point kind of come in. Where Medicare was because the government saw that, you know, that someone needed to offer um, health care to the elderly, and Medicaid because government need to, you know, someone need to offer to the to the poor, quote unquote, but not all poor, just certain certain sections classes of the poor. So government comes in at this point to offer health insurance to these groups who didn't have health insurance. Did the American Medical Association, were they okay with this? I think the American Medical Association, the doctors groups were okay with the government coming through and doing this. Yeah, because they couldn't, you know, pay for it anyways, right? The elderly couldn't, most of them couldn't pay for it. So it just means the government's coming through and telling them, oh, we'll pay for these people. So they were like, woohoo, we're all for this. So they weren't opposed. I mean, they weren't enthusiastic, but they, but they weren't opposed to it like they were just a universal health care because this is basically just providing funding for people who couldn't afford health care. And so American you know, medical hospitals and doctors, they're all for that. What they don't like is they don't like the government coming through and providing health care for people who can't afford it, and the government then setting the prices. That's what they don't want. But they're fine to have the government come through and pay for group for things that that where people aren't paying for it. So back then it was Medicare and Medicaid. During the nineteen or the two thousand and six, what was the other program that that uh, that was introduced by the federal government by Bush? Bush introduced something in 2006. Part of Medicare? Part D? What's Medicare Part D? Say the other? Now, let's see. What's D? Multiple choice question. Is D, is it hospitals, physicians, Medicare Advantage? Or pharmaceuticals? Pharmaceuticals, right? So did the did the pharmaceutical companies like the fact that Medicare Part D was being introduced? You bet. 
because it meant that all these people who couldn't afford medications were suddenly getting paid for by the government. You know, the government it was written into the into the Medicare Part D is that the government can't negotiate prices. So they the pharmaceutical companies didn't want the government to basically negotiate how much they're going to pay. They wanted they wanted the government to pay whatever it was that they charged. And that's pretty much what they got. And that's what happened back here too, is that Medicare and Medicaid came through, but the government couldn't, you know, there was no kind of nothing in that said the government was going to determine how much they were going to pay. In fact, I had a friend who, in the, he used to work in a hospital back in the 1970s, I think. Yeah, 1970s worked in the hospital. And he was in management. And he said that what he did, his job was that, you know, he would get a bill from a doctor and that because the doctor provides some service to the elderly and he would turn around and he'd send the bill off to Medicare and then Medicare would pay him the money and he'd give it to the, to the doctor. And that sometimes the doctor came to him and said, ooh, this was a particularly hard case. And so it was a lot of money. If you send off the bill for it, it got a lot of money back and paid it off. And sometimes, not very often, it was like a very easy case, but that's the way it worked. It also meant that like if they, if a doctor came through and said, you know, we really, really want this new type of machine is that the, you know, they would just buy it and then they'd send Medicare the bill and say, you know, here it is. Or they just build it into the, the Medicare payments. Every, every person would get an additional extra payment to pay for that machine. So it meant that hospitals could basically buy all the different type of things that they wanted to because Medicare was paying for it. And as long as Medicare didn't come through and try to screw them down on the price, things were good. Okay, well, we'll stop there. And I'll, we'll finish up next time. Go watch the tapes. They'll be on the test.